Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. No, we can do better than that. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Hide that word in your heart. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Somebody exalt his name with me. Come on, we came to do it together for 10 seconds all over the world in the chat room for the next 10 seconds it's not about what you've been through what it looks like it's about jesus give him what he deserves not what you feel like come on not what it looks like but give god the glory that he deserves hallelujah glory to his name what a mighty god we serve anybody know he's mighty what a mighty god we serve angels bow before him and heaven and earth adore him what a mighty god we serve what an awesome god we serve if nobody else got a testimony the normal household can declare it today we are here what an awesome god we serve oh bow before him and heaven and earth adore him what an awesome God we and what a forgiving God we serve somebody ought to tell him thank him what a forgiving God we serve hey, angels bow before him and heaven and earth adore him what a mighty God we we serve our God is an awesome God he reigns from heaven above with a wisdom power and love our God is an awesome if you believe it let me hear you say our God is an awesome God from heaven oh with wisdom power and let me hear you say how God is an awesome God he reigns from heaven with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an If you really believe it, let me hear you say, our God. Awesome. Make it personal this time to say, say, my God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with the power of my God. Hey, now let's declare it, say, he's awesome. He's awesome. Awesome. He's 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 awesome
said he's able I don't care how dark it looks he's able I don't care what your money looks like he's able I don't care what they said on your job he's able yes he is yes he is yes he is don't you dare give up you're closer than you think you don't even understand if you hadn't made it to the house of God if you hadn't tuned in today the enemy would have convinced you that it was over but I came to remind you that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask think or imagine he is an able God the devil is a liar 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 yeah he is able somebody believes it receive it in your spirit declare it over your household shout it like you know it shout it like you know it God deserves an awesome praise no an awesome God deserves an awesome praise that's an okay praise that's an I right praise that's a oh that's a, I'll get there when I get there praise but an awesome God deserves an awesome praise magnify him bless him lift him glorify him come on Come on, take yourself out of the equation and give God what you know he deserves in spite of, in the midst of, just because of. He deserves. He is worthy. God is worthy. God is worthy. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the saint, he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Let everything that has breath shout glory. Come on, all over my chat room, let me see you shout, thank you, Jesus. Come on, all the grateful folk in here, shout, thank you, Lord. I'm excited about what God is to say today, and to God be the glory for the many things that he has done. Jabari, I need more of me here. The things that he is doing and the things that he is going to do. I'm truly excited about the goodness of God. Had I not known... Had I not known to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have fainted. But by the grace and mercy of God, I am here. Somebody else ought to testify, I'm here. May not have all the money I need or that I want. I may not have all the things in place. Everything might not be just exactly how I want it and desire it to be, but I'm here. But I'm here. All of my marvel saints should make some noise right here. You are here. A couple things and I'm going to jump right into the heart of the matter, which is the word of God. Let me acknowledge the presence, of, the presence of and thank God for the strength of this woman of God. First Lady Carla Norfolk is in the house.
I'm so, so excited, so humbled, and so honored to serve as her husband and her leader in ministry. And so I've had the privilege of covering her from both facets as her, as her boo and her bae and as her man, mind of God. And I can just say with great joy that this woman and my babies, my children, my nephew, my sister-in-law, the entire family, they are people of faith. They are people who know their God. I'm so proud of how God has ministered to them and lifted them and elevated them in the area of faith and confidence in Christ. If you don't know Jesus, you have to get to know him. He is your strength when you are weak. I'm telling you, he is your comfort when you are in distress and in pain. You have to, if you've never lost anybody, you don't really understand yet, but you need to know, you need to know Jesus. Woo. And not only that, the thing that gives us confidence and the thing that makes this a celebration of life for us in losing my father-in-law, it, it, it is that we know he is absent from this fleshly, earthly vessel, but his spirit is in the presence of an almighty, everlasting, eternal, loving God. These bodies are mere flesh. They even turn back to dust. Come on, somebody. They are frail. They are nothing. They are simply a shell that contains the essence or the soul of the individual that you have come to know. So in order to ensure that you see them again, Get to know Jesus. Not just I know of him, but have a personal relationship with him and accept him as your savior today while you can. I'm preaching already if you ain't figured it out. Accept him today. It's so important. That has become a passion of mine. I am, I am on the mission. My next goal is to reach 100,000 souls for the kingdom. That's what we're about to do. Gear up, soldiers gear up, victory walkers get ready because I can't do it by myself. I got an army. It's gonna be, we're gonna be intentional about reaching at least a hundred thousand souls to add to the kingdom. And it's not just gonna be our church. I'm engaging churches from around the country and around the globe, people in all walks of life. We are going on a crusade. We are literally getting ready to go on a crusade. I'm taking 12 months to get ready. That's how serious it is. We're going to pray over territories, pray over regions. We're going to go and lock arms with the sisters and brothers who are believers and help in everybody's community. You want to know the answer? The answer is not in the police. The answer is not in the mayor of the cities. The answer is not in the, in the, in the uh, government. The answer is not in the justice department. The answer is not out there, but the answer is in here. We have the answer to the world, the world's woes, and his name is so glad that you know him. A couple things, one more time. I, well, another thing that I want to make sure that I throw at you is that next Saturday we start set services on Saturday. Service on Saturday starts next Saturday. Next Saturday. Now we set the time at 12 noon. Please be patient. We're just testing this out to see how it works. See how you feel. See if you are able to get out the beauty, sh the beauty chair in time to get here on Sunday, on Saturday. But we're going to start at noon. We'll take a poll next week and see how it went. Take a gauge and see how it went. But we're starting at noon, which gives you the remainder of your entire Saturday to do whatever it is that you need to do with your family and your whole day on Sunday to celebrate with your family and or relax or to chill or to do whatever you want to do. But we, or if you want to come back to church, you can still come back to church on Sunday too, by the way. <laughs> You're not excluded from coming two times if you need it twice. You might need a double portion. Just come on and get it. But Sunday service on Saturday starts next Saturday at noon. Now, I have another announcement. On next, on first Sunday in September, I am making an executive order. My team does not know. They probably are going to be stunned, shocked. But this is the privilege of the office. <laughs> I had a baby to come up to me. She says, Pastor, when are we going to start back having children's church? I said, hold on, let me get somebody that can answer the question. I called Pastor Gay with an office. I said, she got something to ask you. 
So we talked it out. Youth church. We're going to start youth church on not children's church. Be mindful that student ministry is divided into two different sections. We have the youth church and then we have the children's church. We will not start children's church. We have not worked out all the details. We don't even have all the people. Some of the people have not come back for various reasons, medical challenges and or uh, just not feeling comfortable. And I'm okay with that. But we need more people that will volunteer to help serve the babies or help serve the children. So if you are here and you know that's a calling and an anointing on your life, please step to the plate. We don't have enough people. That's the only reason I can't do it now. We don't have enough people. In the youth area, however, we are stocked, ready, and loaded. So the youth church will start first Sunday in September. Amen? Our youth will start having worship first Sunday in September. Amen. We're opening up the sanctuary on the south side at Victory City in Chicago next Sunday. Next Sunday at 10 o'clock, same time. Same time. Same bat channel. Same church family. Amen. Amen. Y'all real quiet in here today. It's really quiet. It's making me nervous. I said amen. Amen. I think I covered everything. Did I get everything? All right, cool. Join with me. I'm ready for the word of God. Join with me. I got a little help right here. Thank you, Jesus. Go to John, the 11th chapter. God, get the glory out of this moment. You set it up. You sent us here. You did it for your purpose and not ours. You did it so that you would be glorified and not us. So we decrease that you might increase the more in this atmosphere. That you take authority over my words, over my mouth, over my speaking. That you get the glory, God. I yield my members unto you, your servant I have already become. And so it is that I ask that you would fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit let the anointing of God speak through me and to me that the words of my mouth are pleasing and acceptable in your sight and that ultimately you are edified that the people are edified and you are glorified and the enemy is horrified thank you Lord that I'm not terrified because I'm going to step boldly before the throne of God yank from the heavens what I need to deposit in the earth and let every nugget that is pulled in here breathe life into dead situations. Get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. John 11, 1 through 7. We'll start there and then we'll jump over to 11 through 14. John 11, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll go to verses 11 through 14. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his, her sisters, the sisters rather, sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now jump down to verses 11 through 14. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll, get all right. he'll be okay. <clears throat> he will get well. Verse 13, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest in sleep. So in verse 14, he clarifies. Then Jesus said to them plainly, listen, y'all don't get it. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Preach through me in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. For those of you who have not caught on, the series title is what? Marvel. It is Marvel. I have not had the privilege of preaching since the first sermon, so I'm going to give you some brief recap uh, just to remind you that we, we are excited about the whole concept, the whole understanding of what Marvel is, what it represents. It started as a comic book, but has now become a conglomerate, a massive machine of media. It is everything you can think of in media. 
uh, that, that now makes up or comprises the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. Many of us, we have experienced uh, the movies firsthand. Some of the brothers can testify, and the sisters too. We enjoy every dynamic, every element, every aspect of what has become our Marvel movies. Uh, those of you who were here the first weekend of this series, I, I shared that I am enthralled with everything Marvel. I love the Marvel series. I love the movies. I love the superhero concept. I love the construct. I love the action. You know, I am, I am a proponent of action. If you want to keep me, make sure the action is at the beginning and not in the middle of the movie because I may not make it. Marvel never disappoints. They always come in with a bang. They start off and they hit it hard and it's right for me. And so I am always with bated breath on the edges of my seat waiting to see what is the next Marvel movie that they're going to drop and who is the next superhero and what villain are they going to be up against. I have become, as many people have, enthralled with the entire concept that Marvel movie presents through their superhero sagas. And, and, and so much so, are people enthralled and excited and captivated by the whole Marvel movement that they have amassed a, 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 a ridiculously awesome amount of $22.5 billion in movies. Their gross revenues have now reached $22.5 billion, which says that I'm not the only one who really looks forward to grabbing and gravitating towards a Marvel movie. And if you were here, uh, and, and just in case you weren't, let me remind you that the, the whole word Marvel, I did my, deep, my deep, deep dive and I did my research to figure out what was the whole concept behind Marvel. Where did it come from? How did it, what was its inception? It started as a comic book. It transformed, it translated. It had, it had a myriad of different facets that were added to it along the way. And then it jumped off of the page and onto the screen and became this massive thing. But what is the very essence of Marvel itself? And the only really way, the only real way, true way to know and understand how the dynamics of Marvel even manifested in the way that we now know it is to go back to the foundational component and even figure out what does the word Marvel mean? What is the essence of the name? What is the, the thorough uh, depiction or understanding of, of, of the very content of the name Marvel? And I, I, I brought up for our understanding the definition of Marvel, which is simply to be filled with wonder or astonishment. To be filled with wonder or astonishment. And, and other synonyms that are used for the word Marvel are things like miracle, phenomenon, sensation. Miracle, phenomenon, sensation, or to be filled with wonder or astonishment. And just in case you were not here, let me help you understand why you are a marvel. You, you are not the same type of marvel that, uh, that, that this comic book has manifested or you're not the same type of superhero that we see on the silver screen that we celebrate on the big cinema but you are a different type of marvel who has gone through so much in your life has experienced so much pain and heartache and heartbreak and disappointment and, and, and depression and anxiety and stress and tests but you've come out on the other side of the test being able to declare with great joy like a kid running out of the classroom with an A on his paper, I passed. Some of you might have gotten a C, but it don't matter. You still passed. I want to help you all out. It may not have come out the way that you wanted. You might have gotten out with a limp. You might have had to crawl out, scoot out, roll out, push out, but you came out. And the fact that you are sitting here today or sitting at home today listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth means that you pass and if you pass you are a marvel what do you mean pastor you are full of wonder and astonishment you are a miracle a phenomenon a sensation and trust me the natural average person would not have been able to take what you made it through and not only did you come through but you came out dancing you came out shouting you came out praising I just need my marvel saints to make some noise shouted I am a marvel 
See, if they knew the hell that you've been through, they would understand why you got to shout so hard. They would understand why you got to testify. They would understand why you pop your collar and keep it moving. They would understand why you got to look at them and say, hey, I can't help it. Just throw your hands up and say, I can't help it. I'm a marvel. That's why they want to see you. That's why they want to know what you're doing. They want to, want to be all up in your business. That's why they got to follow you on social media with a fake name. I feel something right there. Yeah, that's why they got to creep. That's why they're trolling you. That's why they're going and looking at your comments. And that's why they're going and putting fake names and making comments because they can't help it. Let me tell you why. They can't understand. The enemy cannot understand. Let's not, we wrestle not with flesh. Ephesians 6 and 12. It's not flesh and blood. People ain't your problem. So let's look deeper than the people. The people are being used by a demonic principality. Are you with me? See, the problem with you is you keep going back and forth and fighting the people. But if you stop warring with weapons of carnality and of this world and start warring in heavenly places, the people will be, you won't even care what the people are doing. Because the frustration and the reason that they keep coming at you and attacking you, the reason that things keep happening like this is because the devil cannot understand for the life of him. Why are you still alive? How are you still praising God? How are you still giving God glory? How do you still have a smile on your face? How did you make it to the worship today with all that I hit you with last week? All the stuff you've been through and you still had the audacity to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What? You're a marvel. You're a marvel. You're an awesome wonder. <laughs> and so part of being a marvel is understanding that the reason I'm able to do this, the reason I can take a licking and keep on ticking, the reason that I still got push-up, go-on power, the reason I still can, can keep moving, it, it's not because of me. It's because it's not my story. It's his story. He just let me be one of the players in his cast. It's not my story. And, and, and I didn't write it. <laughs> I didn't write it. I, I, didn't, I did not write it. Don't be mad at me because it didn't work. I didn't write this. I keep telling the devil, I didn't write this. Leave me alone. I'm on payroll. This ain't my story. I didn't say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He did. I didn't say greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. He did. I didn't say I am more than a conqueror because he loves me. He did. Why you keep beating me up? I didn't write this. We are a part of his story. Here it is. This is the message for today. I got to hit it and quit it. I can't. Can't stay here long because I'll shout myself crazy. Here's the message for today. It's not our story. It's his story, right? But your part of his story is not done. It's not finished. Your part in his story is not finished. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what your circumstance is. I don't care what your bank account says. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what's going on in this pandemic. This is not the end of your story. How do you know, Pastor? Because you are sitting here with breath in your body, activity in your limbs. You woke up in a right mind and he lets you get here to hear this word because he needed you to know this is not the end. He wrote you in and he did not write you out so they cannot write you off. God is writing your next chapter. And here's the good news. Oh, oh, help me, God. I'm trying to keep it together. The next chapter is always written so that you come out better than the chapter before. 
you missed it. Y'all missed it. Your next chapter has to be better than your last chapter. Why? Because he says your latter shall be greater than your former. That means what's coming in your next chapter is going to be like nothing you have ever witnessed in your life. Mind-blowing favor. Bless your name, God. Stop putting a period where God put a comma. This is not your final chapter. The days ahead of you are greater than what's behind you. So that means, get this, that means if he was good in your last chapter. Take that in for a second. I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. If he made a way out of no way in your last chapter, if he provided for you and put food on your table, roof over your head, clothes on your back, if you were able to qualify with jacked up credit in your last chapter, if you can you imagine what he's gonna do now that you got your credit together? Can you imagine what he's he's about to blow? He, I'm about to lose my mind up in here because when I think of what he's already done, if the latter is gonna be greater, I can shout right now. Thank you, Lord. You are part of a story that you didn't write. And aren't you glad that the author loves you so much that he writes it in such a way that it works for your good? And we know. <laughs> Aren't you excited to know that where you are is not where you're going to end? Are you excited to know that where your family is now is not where your family will end? That he's writing a phenomenal story. So I started breaking down stories because I said, God, you're such an incredible writer. I want to do a deeper dive and a discovery on what does it take to make a comprehensive story? What, what are the elements, what are the components that make stories complete? Full, engaging, entertaining, captivating. What makes Marvel, Marvel? And, and all of them have the same, uh, the same dynamics and they're the very foundational elements of really any story. They have characters. Lest the reader feels something for the character, they won't care what happens to them. They have a plot. That's what happens in the story. They have a setting where and when the things take place. They have a point of view. Whose story are they telling? They have a style. That's the tone and the way that the story is being told in the voice of the author. They have a theme. What is the main storyline? They have a literary device that they throw in here and there to help accomplish their goals, like humor and metaphor and simile and different feelings or things that evoke certain feelings. So these are foundational elements of every single story. But all the Marvel comics have something else added to the equation in that they also have a superhero. And remember, heroes are only made when someone or something needs a savior. <laughs> All my superheroes, let me help you understand. The reason you were fearfully and wonderfully created, the reason that he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb because your substance was not hidden from them, the reason that you even exist is because you first popped into the mind of the writer and the writer says there's a problem in the earth. There's something that needs to be done. There's something that needs to be changed. There's somebody that needs help. There's something that needs covering. There's something that needs. So I'm going to create you and you are the superhero that's going to step to the scene and say, da -da -da -da, I'm here to save the day. I'm here to pray you through, pull you through. I'm here to push you through. I'm here to give you what God has given me. I'm here to teach you, train you, equip you. I'm here to lead you to Jesus Christ. I'm here to help you get to salvation. I am a superhero on my job, in the break room, driving down the street, walking in the mall, in the grocery store, I, at the counter, at the airline. I've asked everybody that I can since God deposited this in my heart. What church you go to? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Because I 
I realize I'm not just saving somebody on a Sunday morning to attend a service, but I'm saving somebody's soul so that they can attend eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ. So all of you are superheroes, and when he made you, he made you because he had a purpose for your life. Say it to yourself, say, I am a superhero. Now watch this, you're only a hero because God made you a hero. He gave you, invested within you the purpose that you have in order to meet the needs of other people. That's what makes you a hero. But you're only super because you got God on top of it. Be very clear that in the natural, in our own capacity, in our own strength, you can do nothing. With him all things are possible, without him nothing is possible so the super on your hero is what causes you to be used by God in supernatural ways that's how he increases and elevates you above your natural natural capacity and your normal capacity and allows you to accomplish things that cause you to step back and look in marvel and wonder and say I don't know how in the world I even pulled that off you ever have situations and circumstances that God put you in and you didn't think you had the ability, the capacity, you didn't have the wherewithal to actually do it, but you look back and not only did you do, do it, but you knocked it out of the park and you have to scratch your head in bewilderment and say, I don't know how in the world. I don't know how in the world I made it through that. I don't know how in the world I had the words to speak into their life. I don't know how in the world I was able to help them through something and I'm going through all the hell that I'm going through. I don't know how in the world I'm still preaching and I got the weight of the world on my shoulder. I don't know how in the world I still got a prayer life when I need somebody to pray for me. I don't know how in the world. Have you ever been in a moment where you had to look and say, it's only because God put his super on my natural Nobody wants a boring, predictable plot. You watch movies that are cheap movies. And you can tell, oh, okay, all right, she about to fall. Here she go. Three, two, one. Woo! All right. The black one's going to die first. Here they go. One, two, three. wants a boring predictable plot so whenever a writer has authority of the pen and they want to reverse the storyline to make sure that it's captivating engaging that it works that it wins like Marvel wins what they do is they infuse story conflict Story conflict is nothing more than an, uh, nothing less than an obstacle placed between the protagonist and their goal. And so even in life, the enemy, I have Scott one time, I said, hey, I don't understand. Why do you not get rid of the devil? You're God. You created him. You can, you can eliminate him. Erase it, Lord. I mean, he keeps causing all kind of havoc and he keeps raising hell, literally. What's wrong with your eraser, Jesus? As a matter of fact, I got a list. Erase all of them. Don't act like I'm the only one with a list. And he answered me very poignantly. He said, well, two things. First of all, remember, you on somebody else's list too. I said, my bad, you ain't got to say nothing else. He said, no, I got to give you the second part of the answer. The second part of the answer is because you learn how to pray because I infuse some conflict. You learn how to lean and depend on me because I put some conflict in your story. You didn't know what trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not to your own understanding was until you didn't have nobody else to trust in. When your friends stabbed you in the back, your family was not around, your circumstance turned upside down. It was in those moments that you learned not how to be cute and
and just lean on me, but you learn how to get close and lay on me. If I have not allowed some conflict to come into your life, I use the enemy and he doesn't even know he's being used. He keeps pushing people to me. The more he attacks, the more y'all cling. The more he attacks, the more you pray. The more he attacks, the more you worship. The more he attacks, the closer you get. So I had to give you some conflict. I said, okay, God, that's why you God. Quite frankly, conflict is the key to why the Marvel movies have worked so well. It's because the characters always have conflict. Conflict is real interesting, however, because it's not just, you know, this one against that one. No, there's layers to this thing. Conflict is not simplistic. There's four different types of conflicts that Marvel movies use. They use moral conflict. That's good guy versus bad guy. In the Avengers, we see uh, that this type of conflict exists between the Avengers and the villain Loki, who wants to rule Earth by force. Conflict is intrinsic within it. Then there's physical conflict, because moral conflict typically leads to physical conflict. Don't act like I'm the only one that has a black family gathering. Let me let that set in for a few seconds. Because a moral conflict at the card table, on the basketball court, if you let it go too long, if Big Ma don't scoot around the corner in that duster with that knot tied in the side of them knee highs and shut it down, that moral conflict is going to turn into a physical conflict. Where, where, are my, where are my real folk at up in here today? Okay. Marvel also infuses personality conflict. If you see, remember there was Thor and there was Tony Stark and their egos are so inflated that they cannot even stand to be in the presence of one another. So there's personality conflicts. Then there's natural conflicts. That's things that nobody physically uh, has anything to do with. It's inanimate conflict. Like a force of nature, a storm, a mechanical machine goes awry, or a hostile environment. Those are things that nobody else. But these are the layers and levels of different types of conflict. And many of us, if we look at our lives, our lives are riddled with the same thing. That's what has made our story worth telling. Nobody wants to hear your boring plot. You ever been talking to somebody and you, you feel like they're talking like Charlie Brown? Wah, 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 wah. And every now and then you grab a word and say, oh yeah, uh-huh. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. All on the inside you're saying, please shut up. What you say you called me? I'll be back. Hey! <laughs> well, he'd be over there secretly texting. Call my phone right now. Call my phone. Call my phone. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> conflict is always about the character trying to get past an obstacle to reach their goal. And every time you encounter an obstacle, every time you go through conflict, it either helps you get closer to the goal, it'll push you further away from the goal, which is meant to not deter you, but to make you work harder, or you'll learn new clues that help you get closer to the goal the next time. That's what it's there for. I have to throw that in because you don't realize that your story is being written by God and that God threw some conflict in, and those are the, the different outcomes that he is hopeful of. And Jesus sweetened, he sweetened the story and took it from good to great in the text today. When you look at the text, it's a very familiar passage of scripture, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving you backdrop in history. But when you get an opportunity, read the 11th chapter of John and read the whole depiction of what happened in the life of Lazarus between Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and the disciples. But when Jesus got ready to execute that portion of his story. And he started scripting it out and he allowed what he had scripted to be played out on real time on the, on the screen, on the screen of our real time lives. 
He put some things in place and made sure that this story had conflict, but that it also had the resolution of the conflict. The one thing that I like about the Marvel uh, uh, series is that typically they will give you a resolution to the major conflict in this, on the screen. There's only one time that I can remember they didn't resolve the conflict in that movie, but they came back in the next movie and they resolved the conflict. And that, that's what I know about God is that God doesn't leave us in limbo. But he, he is the author, get this, and he is the finisher. He, he's not an incomplete God. There is no I on his track record or his report card. He is a God that completes the task. He is faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus' coming. That's what the word says. And that's what my history says with him. So in this story of Lazarus, Jesus sweetened the story and took it from a good story and made it a great story by adding some conflict. Here you have Lazarus, who is a friend of Jesus. Jesus has fellowship with his family. His sister has washed his feet with her hair. Martha has prepared food for him to eat. He has fellowship with them. He has supped with them. And he calls them friend. This is Jesus' friend. Well, he takes ill in a serious way. So much so that the sister said, we need to send for the Savior. Go find Jesus. They go out and they bring word to him. Several things are the manifestation of, of his scripting. The first thing that I noted is that he was both passive and positive in his approach. Jesus received the news that Lazarus was sick, but he remained positive and he remained passive. He remained passive and he remained positive. What do you mean by that? Because when the sister sent word, you've got to know that sending word to him, going after him, sending somebody to retrieve him because they know that he has the power and the authority and the capacity and the miraculous ability to heal their brother. So you have to know that what they sent and the word that was brought was brought with a sense of urgency. I need you to do something now. It's a desperate situation. I'm on the fence. This thing is getting bad. It's taking a turn. I'm about to lose my mind. Things are critical. I need you to move right now. And how many of us have ever been in a place where we, we sin for God, but we don't sin for him real light? We sin for him with desperation and panic, and we sin for him with urgency. We sin for him with, with, uh, with haste. Lord, Lord I need you to show up right now I need you to make a way out of no way I need you to move this I need you to remove this I need you to push me through this I need you to help me in this I need you to give me what I need and I don't need it tomorrow as a matter of fact I remember this young man even wrote a song about it and said I don't need you later I need you now so I know what it feels like to be desperate I know what it feels like to, to go to God in urgency. I know to go, and, and what the last thing you want is for God to be passive and positive. Lord, you, did you hear me? He says, yes, I heard you when you prayed the first time. He says, Lord, Lord well, no, you, didn't, you didn't hear me because ain't nothing moving. The sisters sent word to him in urgency. This was his friend. And he says, okay, I'll help him. No, no, Jesus, you didn't understand. No, he's about to die. Things are, things are looking bad. It's not good. He said, okay, I got him. I got him. He said, no, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. You don't understand. My bills are due. My money is funny. My finances are fickle. My friends are gone. It, it's, it's really critical right now. I'm in a bind. I'm in a pickle. I'm in a pinch. Something is not going. Everything is upside down. Things are turned around. I'm really desperate, Lord. I need you to do something right now. He said, no, 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 I got you. Well, Lord, when are you going to help me? He said, I got you, I'll be there in two days. No, 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 no. You didn't hear me. You didn't understand. See, you don't, you mean you must not know exactly what's happening. See, let me lay the the program out. He says, No, no, I understand. I wrote the story. He said, I'll be there in two days. He was passive and he was positive. 
Why are you not panicked? I keep trying to tell you, I wrote the story. God doesn't have to panic about the ending of a story that he pins. The reason you're panicked is because you don't trust the author. <laughs> I felt that for you. I did. I felt it. I felt it when I wrote it. If you trust the author, then you don't panic. You stay passive and positive. You ask and you wait. You ask and you anticipate. You ask and you expect. You ask and you speak it. You ask and you declare it. You ask and you prepare. You ask and you plan. You ask and you praise. Because it's already done. Five seconds. Please don't be long because I ain't got much time. Five seconds. For whatever you're expecting God to do, that you've already asked him for. This is a test of the emergency praise system. I don't want you to wait till you see it, but trust the one with the pen and thank God that is working for your good. Whatsoever thing you ask when you pray, believe that you have received and you will have what you have said. Double time, five more seconds for the increase that you don't even know is coming. Praise him in the chat room right now. Blow it up right now. Glory to your name. All right, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Come on, sit down. He was passive and positive, but he was also prophetic because he declared, he said, listen, chill out. This sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death. This sickness is gonna be okay. Lazarus is asleep. So the disciples says, well, cool. If he's asleep, we don't need to rush back there. They were trying to kill us over there. Don't go back to Judea, we're good. He'll wake up, somebody else will wake him up, he got it. He said, no, he understood, y'all don't understand. He's not sleeping as you suppose, he's actually, Lazarus is dead. Now I'm confused. He says, he says, Lazarus is asleep. Got it? This sickness is not unto death. Lazarus is asleep. But then he goes on to say, when they don't understand, he says, no, 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 Lazarus is dead. Oh, I'm confused. You just put some conflict in here. Because you said, this sickness is not unto death. And then you just turned around and told us, Lazarus is dead. Now I'm confused. This doesn't make sense. This sickness is not unto death. Lazarus is dead. He says, Here, here's the challenge you're having. The conflict that you're having, see, all conflict is not external. Some conflict is internal. The conflict that you're having inside my story is that you're wrestling with the difference between facts and truth. See, fact is that Lazarus is dead. Truth is he was wounded for my transgressions. Bruised for my iniquity, the chastisement of my peace is upon him and by my stripes, Lazarus will be healed. Are y'all with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so here's the problem. You keep confusing facts with truth. You don't have any money in your bank account. Fact. You done lost your job. Fact. You don't see physically how you gonna make ends meet. Facts. But then truth says my God 
who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein shall supply truth. Do y'all see what I'm saying? So here's the thing. Don't keep quoting the facts. Declare the truth. Start saying truth over your life. Start speaking truth over your family. Start speaking truth. You are the head and not the tail above and not beneath the lender and not the borrower. You are who God says you are. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are set apart by God. You are a peculiar people. You are his chosen generation. You are his children. You are his beloved. You are the ones he, you are the apple of his eye. You're the one he sent his son to die for I don't care what they said about you I don't care how they dogged you out I don't care how they talked about you guilt and shame don't belong to you let me tell you guilt and shame will get out of the way when you realize who else is chasing you because surely not just guilt and shame but goodness and mercy are trying to arrest your life because you belong to God truth Truth, truth. Facts, I got cancer. Truth, I am healed. Facts, I am sick. Truth, I am well. Do you, do you get it? Do you see it? So, God spoke prophetically to them. And let me show you the pattern of God in Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8. Be strong and, good and, and of good cheer. Do not fear or be afraid of them. Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8. You don't have to go there, but I want to throw this at you. In verse 7, then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, he said, be strong and courageous. For you must go with this people to the land which the Lord God has sworn to your fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. Now, verse 8. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Isaiah 45 and 2. I will go be for you and make the rough places smooth. Exodus 13 and 21. The Lord was going be for the people in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on their journey. Samuel 5 and 24 and when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees then rouse yourself for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. See, God's pattern is set. God's process is typical and is set in that he goes out before you. Before you even get to it, God has already gotten to it and worked it out for your good. So understand that when he said to the disciples, this sickness is not unto death, even though Lazarus died, what the Lord was doing was sending his word ahead of them on the journey and his word was already at the tomb before they ever realized the tomb was there y'all missed it God sent a word before you it does not matter what it looks like it does not matter what it says it does not matter about the facts God has already sent his word before you here's a word well, what word did he send before me? I, I, I need that word. Write this, just like the song says. I want you to write this word in your heart. Write this on the tablet of your heart. Psalm 118 and 17. Okay? I shall not die, but live. And I'm going to live to tell how good God was. I will not die, but live. 
and I'm going to declare in my actions and my activities the goodness of who God is, the works of his hand in my life. So you start saying, when the, when the problem, before the problem ever becomes a problem, before it's manifested or even realized, you start quoting Psalm 118 and 17. Don't you panic. You stay positive, you stay passive, and you be prophetic. And you say, I will live and not die. And I'm going to live to declare the works of the Lord. They going to know who did this. By the time I get through tearing some stuff up, by the time I get through dancing and praising God, by the time I get through testifying, giving honor to God who is the head of my life, to the ushers, the deacons, the pastors, the church, the windows, the walls, the roaches, and everything in between. If it was not for the Lord, I would not be here right now. You can't tell it. Let me tell it what the Lord has done for me. He's been good. I should have been. I would have been. I could have been. But I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. He sent his word before. His word was already at the tomb before they ever got there. Not only was he prophetic, but he was patient. Because to illustrate the authority and his confidence in himself. See, he believed in himself. He trusted himself. That when he sent the word, he didn't run after it to try to chase it. He sat back and chilled for another two days. He says, no, I'm going to wait two more days. But Jesus, when we get there, according to Jewish tradition, he's going to be dead four days. He's going to be stinking. His, the soul has already left the body. There's no hope for anything. He said, that's when I work the best. That's when I show out. That's when I show up. That's when I show out. That's when I show you who I am. Philippians 4, 16, uh, 4 and 6 says, be not anxious for anything. But with all things in prayer and supplication, make your requests known unto the Lord. Mark 11 and 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you have already received. Sit back, chill, wait. And he was patient, not only with the process or with the circumstance, but he was even patient with the people. Because he, he was addressed by Mar Martha. Martha ran out with a tube. I, I just imagined in my mind's eye that Martha was rolling her neck. Click clack. If you had been here, my brother would not be dead. He was patient. You better thank God he's been patient with you. How many times have you doubted, disbelieved, worried, panicked, stressed, stayed up all night long? I'll never forget, my mama Wiley is here. I got a lot of mamas, but there's some of them that's stronger than the, the other ones in different areas. I got one that can fight and cut you. I got one that can pray with you. I got one that, I got a mama for all occasions. Mama Wiley called me, she the one that'll get Don't think it's far, it's in the purse, it's in the purse. I'm just telling you now. And she real quick with it too. Mama Wiley called me one night, I was up late. She said, honey, you been on my heart, what's going on? I said, I don't know, I'm just up, I can't sleep. You know? She said, now listen, you and God can't be up. One of y'all need to go to sleep. He got this baby, and what he ain't got, just tell me who it is. Y'all put your little coins together and just come get me out. <laughs> He's so patient with us. He was prophetic. He was patient. He was positive. He remained passive. But then he stepped up and he showed power. Here it is real quick. I got to be done. He says, Lazarus, come forth. You know the story. Remove the stone. Take away the thing that has sealed what you think is finished. Get rid of the thing that makes you feel it's over. Cancel the voices that make you doubt who you are. 
shut out the noise that keeps speaking to you and telling you what you cannot do. Stop looking at social media feeds that make you feel bad. Remove the stone. He says, Lazarus, come forth. We know he called Lazarus by name because Lazarus was the only one to come forth. If he had just said, come forth, everything dead would have arisen. That's the kind of authority that he walks in. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes out. But the most powerful thing is not even that Lazarus came out from the grave and was dead. Let me tell you what struck me. It was amazing. Don't get me wrong. Miraculous. Amazing. Astounding. Bewildering. Can you imagine? Can you just, just, just for a minute imagine that you're standing there at the cemetery You was there when they laid him in the tomb. You've already grieved and mourned. You saw the body for yourself four days ago. They say, move the stone. For what? It stinks now, Lord. Move the stone. He said, Lazarus, hey, come on. And Lazarus gets up. I hesitate to think it was an African American congregation. <laughs> Wouldn't have been no more witnesses. <laughs> what we running for? I don't know. I found that on Facebook. <laughs> that was amazing. I'm talking to y'all at home, but the most powerful thing is not that he just got up from the dead. That was great. But let me help you out. The most powerful thing that he did was show forth his authority, his compassion, his love, his ability to pin a great story was this. In verse 43, he says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. See, it was necessary for him to say that part because it's possible for you to be resurrected and still not free. He's been resurrecting you from situation and circumstance after circumstance after circumstance. He's been resurrecting you over and over again. He's been resurrecting your circumstance. He's been blowing life back into stuff over and over again all your life. You lost your job, but you didn't lose your way because he still made a way out of no way. You lost relationships and friendships, but God still provided and sustained. He became a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You lost your way, and God sent light to guide you back on the right path and loved you back to life. Over and over again, he's been resurrecting you. But it is possible for you to be resurrected, and you're still bound. Loose here in the name of Jesus. Every chain that has been holding you hostage. I bind it in the name of Jesus. Chains are about to fall off of your life. I hear chains falling everywhere. You've had chains on your dreams. Loose here in the name of Jesus, release them and let them soar. You've had chains on your hopes. You've become so hopeless. Life has hit you so hard over and over and over and over again in the same places that you feel like you're never going to rebound or recover. I loose you in the name of Jesus. Great clothes have to let you go. It's not over. You're not dead. You're not done. He's not finished. Your story is still being written. And a 
care how old you are, how young you are. I don't care where you think you've fallen. I don't care how far you think you've gone. I don't care if you felt it's too late. I came to tell you those chains of your potential are about to be released. And when they fall off this time, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I feel a release in the atmosphere all over the world on global campus I feel a release in your atmosphere there's a release there's a release you've been out but you've been in your grave clothes you've been up but you've been in your grave clothes they have to let you go today this is the last day that you feel that you can't this is the last day you feel inferior and you feel less than this is the last day that you do not take your posture and your position as a superhero this is the last day that the enemy convinces you that you don't have it what it takes this is the last day that you feel like it's not going to happen I release you in the name of Jesus Christ that every demonic bondage every principle everything that has been shackled in your mind that has kept you hostage to the ground you are an eagle eagles were not made to eat with chickens there is something so incredible about you something so spectacular inside of you something so phenomenal because we have this treasure and God hid it in earthen vessels there is power in your speaking there is power in your walking there is power in your wit and I loose you in the name of Jesus. I feel a freedom coming in your life. I feel a freedom coming in your life. You're going to be free to worship, free to dance, free to praise, free to write, free to create, free to launch the business, free to start it. But it's in the middle of a pandemic. That's when God does his best work. It, it's in the middle of this situation. Things are going down. That's when God goes up. He got to show you that it's not dead. You're not dead. Lazarus is not dead. You are not dead. You are not. This thing is not unto your death. It was made to take you out, but now, nah, now, nah, now, nah, now. Nah, I'm still here. Take hold of your liberty. Take hold of your freedom. Just take hold of your freedom. Let God do what God desires to do in your life. I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting, it's just a blessing. Somebody help me, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us of who we are and whose we are. Thank you that our story is not done. <laughs> thank you, God, that it's not finished. And that the next chapter is going to be better than the last chapter. Thank you that what is to come is going to be better than anything that has been. Thank you, Lord, even for the conflict. <laughs> it is good that I have been afflicted, says Paul. I understand, God, that the conflict has been meant to push me closer to my promise. So I thank you for keeping me in the midst of it. Thank you for bringing me through it. And thank you that the grave clothes are falling off. Dead stuff has to leave. Because you're a God that speaks life. And all the things that have held us captive are no longer going to captivate us. We are captivated by faith in Jesus Christ. And we believe, we believe that everything that you promised you would do, you're going to do. Thank you. Somebody is going to hear your voice through this moment and receive you as their savior. That this will not be the end of their story, but they're going to write the greatest ending. You've written rather the greatest ending known to mankind. That's whosoever believeth in you shall not perish, but they have everlasting life. Give them eternity through their faith 
and the profession of faith and confidence in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. For whatever it is that you understand the chains are falling off of in your life, whatever area, I want you to have this level of confidence and praise God in advance for what you're expecting him to do. No, no, no. If you're not expecting much, that's cool. But if you're really expecting God to do great things, my chains are falling off. I'm out these grave clothes. I'm revived, refreshed, renewed, and I'm free. Glory to his name. If you're here today under the sound of my voice and you've never received Christ as your savior, this is your chance, this is your moment, this is your turn, this is your time. Two things I'm gonna ask you to do. I wanna ask you to pray this prayer of salvation with me. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Here's the thing, all of us will leave here. The question is, where will you spend eternity? In heaven or in hell? It's really simple. It's really simple, it's not hard at all. If you confess, and make Jesus your Lord and Savior. He has already given you a guarantee of eternity. You will have salvation in heaven with him forever. It makes no sense for you to miss heaven and spend eternity in hell where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth and torment for all of eternity. Don't miss heaven when it's free. He paid the price so that the chains would fall off and you could be free to receive him and spend eternity with him. Second thing is that once you pray this prayer, if you're praying it for the first time, even at, at home or wherever you're watching us, text us at 38470. Text the word SAVED, 38470, and we're going to connect with you, equip you, pray with you, and give you everything that you need to be fruitful, positive, and powerful on this journey. You need guidance. It's not enough for you to just say, I'm saved. Now you have to start living as one who is saved because the enemy knows you're saved and he's going to do everything that he can to push you away from God. But you need an army of people to help you and pull you closer to God so that you can start walking in the power and authority that he has invested in you. We want to teach you that. We want to equip you with that. We want to arm you. So text 38470, the word saved, after we pray this prayer. Family, all over the world, pray it together. Say, Lord, thank you for this day and for preserving my life for this very moment. I admit I am a sinner, but I'm so grateful that you forgive me. I believe you were born, I believe you died, and by faith, I believe you were raised from the dead. And with this confession, I'm excited to say, I am saved. Give God glory for your salvation.